from Florence, Italy. The city of inspiration for sculptors in ages past and for centuries to come. You're listening to The Sculptor's Funeral. Good day to you all, and welcome again to The Sculptor's Funeral, the podcast for figurative sculptors around the world. I'm your host, Jason Arkels, a sculptor and art historian living and working in Florence, Italy, the cradle of the Renaissance, and a city where all the great sculptors are dead, and I don't feel so well myself. And today, continuing our foray into the golden age of classical Athens, we come to the sculptor Polyclitus. In the last few episodes, which have focused on the life and work of the sculptor Phidias, I stated that if you had to choose one sculptor as the epitome of classical Greek sculpture, it would have to be Phidias. Well, Polyclitus would come in at a very close second in my book, and it's not unreasonable for others to place Polyclitus at the forefront. Maybe it's most fitting to place Phidias and Polyclitus side by side, I mean, if we have to rank them at all because both were fundamental to the development of Greek classical sculpture, but in distinct ways. First, let's talk about the similarities between these two sculptors. For a start, both Phidias and Polyclitus both learned their craft from the same master, the sculptor Hegelidus, the bronze sculptor from Argos, who may well have been the first to perfect the lost wax casting process for large-scale bronze sculpture. And Hegelidus had many pupils and assistants, and a school of sculptors developed around Argos that lasted generations. And along with Myron, the sculptor of the Discobolus, or discus thrower, Phidias and Polyclitus were pupils there too, under Hegelidus. Now, we don't have hard dates for the birth and death of Polyclitus, but we do think he was active as a sculptor from around 460 BC to about 410 or maybe even all the way to the year 400 BC, which would probably make him a bit younger than Myron or Phidias, and would also make him a pretty long-lived sculptor. Now, like his peers, Myron and Phidias, the work of Polyclitus was almost entirely of bronze, and like the other two, his work is known to us only through Roman-era marble copies made after those bronze originals. Now, if Phidias was known for being the sculptor of gods, like his famous Athena Parthenos and his colossal seated Zeus made of ivory and gold, then Polyclitus was known for being the sculptor of men, more specifically of warriors and athletes. Early in his career, Polyclitus sculpted an athlete scraping his skin with a tool called a strigil. See, Greek athletes would scrape the sweat and dust off of themselves after athletic competitions using little scrapers called strigils, And this would become a popular motif in Greek art. And it's known as an apoximenos, which simply means the scraper. Now, you might be familiar with a different Greek statue of the same name called apoximenos, but that was done by a later Greek sculptor called Lysippus. And we'll get to him in a future episode. But the apoximenos by Polyclitus is, for the time being, lost. Another early example of Polyclitus, and one which likely survives in Roman copies, comes in the form of a young boxer, a portrait statue of a winning participant in a youth boxing competition named Caniscos. Now, there's a Roman marble copy of this work, which is in the British Museum, and that's just one of several surviving copies and fragments. And the one in the British Museum shows a muscular youth standing in contraposto. His missing arm was raised to his head in a gesture reflecting the boy crowning himself with a laurel wreath. Now, the particular statue in the British Museum actually used to be owned by the early 19th century British sculptor Sir Richard Westmacott. And so sometimes this British Museum copy is called the Westmacott Youth or the Westmacott Athlete. The attribution of the young boxer to Polyclitus is sometimes questioned, mostly because If Polyclitus did make this statue, it would have been made around 460 BC. But if Polyclitus also made his uh, ivory and gold statue of Hera, which history says he did, uh, that was done around the year 400 BC. So then Polyclitus would have a remarkably long career spanning 60 years. It's uh, not out of the realm of possibility. So if all Polyclitus were interested in were sculpting you know, these sort of muscular athletes, he would hardly deserve to be ranked 
among the greatest sculptors of his time. Polycletus additionally pursued, throughout his long career, a line of inquiry that would profoundly impact how sculpture would be made through much of the history of Western figurative sculpture. You see, Polycletus was the first to approach the art of sculpture with a new philosophy and a new technique to make the best, the most beautiful statues he could. Now, of course, every sculptor wants to do their best, and sculptors had used different techniques at different times to do it. You know, in the Archaic period of Greece, for example, sculptors used symmetry and mathematical proportion to create rhythms and intervals and spacing in their work, which had a pleasing regularity. And later, in the Severe period and the Early Classical period, right up to the time of Polycletus, sculptors achieved beautiful work by working to copy more and more faithfully the things in nature which are beautiful. Athletes, warriors, and animals, like Myron's own celebrated heifer. This is the period in which the replication of correct anatomy was mastered by the Greeks. And the idea is simple. If you're going to copy beautiful things, you're going to get a beautiful sculpture. But then comes Polycletus. And what made Polycletus different is that in order to make his beautiful statues, he strove to understand the nature of beauty itself, how beauty works, where to find it, and how to put it into a work of art. It's more than just copying beauty. He attempted to dissect beauty, to be able to create beauty out of nothing, not just copy it. He was one of the first aesthetic theoreticians, and he understood, more than any other sculptor in his lifetime, the fundamental structure of things which please the senses. And he recorded his theories and processes in a handy little book to which he gave the title The Canon. And canon means the law or the criterion. And it's one of art history's great tragedies that the canon of Polycletus does not survive. We don't have a copy of it to read ourselves, but the book and the theories it contained does have a lasting legacy which survives in several forms. For instance, the book, the canon, was widely known in ancient Greece and Rome, and we have writings from authors spanning centuries which refer to Polycletus and to the book and, and to the ideas in the book. And a few of these sources even quote or paraphrase some of the book's contents. So before we take a look at the work of Polycletus, which were the products of these fugitive ideas, let's hear a few quotations from writers who can tell us at least a little bit about the goals of the canon of Polycletus. Now, I found over a dozen ancient writers who talk about Polycletus' ideas and his book, but it's interesting. Most of these writers actually just reference the same two or three paragraphs from the canon, which makes me think that these phrases that you encounter again and again in different writers uh, might have been a bit, you know, maybe these, these were popular and well-known quotes at the time, you know, sort of aphorisms in common use. It's a bit like how many more people know the phrase to be or not to be than have actually read the play Hamlet. So one of Polycletus's popular sayings appears to refer to a guiding principle in his working method, the principle of commensurability. Now, commensurability simply means that two things, or many things, have something in common, a common standard, a shared foundation, quite literally a common denominator. To explain this further, we'll turn now to Galen of Pergamon, the scholarly Greek physician in the 2nd century AD. And in his writings, Galen, at one point, discusses the nature of beauty and discusses the ideas of the Stoic philosopher Chrysippus. Now, Galen writes, Beauty, Chrysippus believes, inheres not in the symmetria of the constituent elements of the body, but in the commensurability of the parts, such as that of finger to finger, and all of these to the palm and wrist, and of these to the forearm, and of the forearm to the upper arm, and of everything to everything else, just as it is written in the canon of Polycletus. For having taught us in that treatise all the commensurate proportions of the body, Polycletus made a work to support his account. He made a statue according to the tenets of his writing, and called it, like the treatise, the canon. Oh, that's such a good quote. It's so informative. Let's, let's, uh, Let's break it down a bit. So he, he starts off by saying, Beauty, Chrysippus believes, inheres not in the symmetry of the constituent elements of the body, 
but in the commensurability of the parts. Now, that really is the red meat of the quote. So this philosopher, Chrysippus, he says that symmetry isn't the basis of beauty. Uh, so what the Egyptians and archaic Greek sculptors were doing by making their work symmetrical, that may be beautiful. The symmetry might contain beauty, but it in itself, symmetry in itself, isn't the root cause of beauty. Beauty isn't inherent in symmetry, or so says Chrysippus. And after all, many beautiful things are not symmetrical. So rather than symmetry, writes Galen, um, you know, and according to Chrysippus and according to Polycletus, beauty is inherent in the commensurability of one part to every other part. The word commensurability in our day has largely been supplanted by the word proportion, which itself derives from the Latin phrase pro portione, which means as regarding its due share. So, what is new about Polycletus' canon of proportion? Weren't formulas already in use in order to develop a figure in sculpture back at least to the Egyptians, who measured out the height of the human figure into 18 parts, as I mentioned several episodes back? Well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they were in use. Canons of proportion were in use. But the proportions derived by the Egyptians were developed to provide uniformity so that many artists across time and location could produce work consistent with each other's work. The early Greeks adopted this method, but then also adapted it as new anatomical insight was gained or tastes and styles changed you know, over several generations. And it's true that the archaic and severe styles, uh, they, they sort of chart a progression towards more naturalistic work, getting away from a strict canon. In other words, work started to look more uh, more lifelike, more plausible. And it's natural to assume that this increasing naturalism implies better proportion. You know, the heads aren't too big and the feet aren't too small. Proportional guidelines must have developed at some point. You know, some sort of working collection of tips and uh, like, you know, a figure should be seven heads high or the length of a foot should be half the length of the lower leg. Lots of sculptors employ these guidelines today. But what makes Polycletus different is that he subsumed whatever number of proportional guidelines existed in his day into one overarching principle that each and every part has a common denominator with each and every other part. There exists a base unit of measurement, and every part of the body is a multiple of or a fraction of that base unit. And use of that base unit to give the entire body commensurability, well, that is the key to beauty. But that's not all. If we go back to that quote by the physician, Galen, we learn that Polycletus put his money where his mouth was. Quote, Polycletus made a work to support his account. He made a statue according to the tenets of his writing, and he called it, like the treatise, the canon. Now, for us, sadly, like the treatise, the sculpture Polycletus called the canon, doesn't seem to survive, not even in marble copies. But that's all right. We can assume Polycletus used the same set of principles and proportions for at least some of his other works. So, does that mean sculptors or art historians, by measuring the marble copies of the works of Polycletus, have discovered the base unit of the body that Polycletus used to tap into beauty? Unfortunately, no, it doesn't, although it's not for a lack of trying. People have been theorizing for centuries as to the key to the canon of Polycletus. Some have said it lies in the measurement of the last knuckle of the little finger in his statues, and others say it's the distance between the width of the eyes. Now, if the canon of Polycletus really does relate every part to every other, the existing fragments of copies of the original sculptures apparently aren't as faithful to the originals as they need to be in order for us to derive that key today. Now, there are other writings from the uh, ancient world to back up Galen's account of Polycletus' mathematical principle of commensurability in sculpture. Philo of Byzantium, also known as Philo Mechanicus, was a 2nd century BC engineer and physicist, and he mentioned in his writings that, quote, it is appropriate to warn the prospective engineer of the saying of Polycletus, the sculptor. Perfection, he said, comes about little by little through many numbers. 
Now, what's interesting is that Plutarch, the Roman author writing a few centuries after that, uses almost exactly the same phrase in his discussion of Polycletus. Quote, Beauty is brought to perfection through many numbers that come to a congruence, so to speak, guided by some system of commensurability and harmony, whereas ugliness is immediately ready to spring into being if only a single chance element be omitted or added out of place. So clearly, there's a link in Polycletus' work between number theory and aesthetic theory. Now, of course, that idea, the close relation between pure abstract number and pure abstract beauty, that actually was a pretty old idea by the time of Polycletus, though he seems to be the first to apply it to sculpture. The great mathematician Pythagoras, alive a century before Polycletus, was the first to discover the relationship between musical tones and number. Different musical notes are created by varying the length of a vibrating string. Thus, in music, a note can be represented by the number, i.e. the length of the string. And a harmony is created when two notes are played together, and the relation of these two notes can be expressed in numbers and by a ratio. So, for instance, a string with a length of two forms a perfect fifth with a string having a length of three. So it can be expressed as a ratio of three to two. So this is, for the Greeks, this was tangible and reproducible proof of the relation between musical beauty and number. And it's not out of the realm of possibility that Polycletus took a note from Pythagoras, pun intended, and applied the idea of the relation between interval and beauty to his own work in sculpture. And with the canon of Polycletus, one interesting theory is that whatever the base unit of commensurability is in the canon, you apply that base unit not simply by multiplying that number, but by increasing the number through a ratio, uh, just like what happens in music theory. You know, in musical theory, you don't get a harmony by doubling or tripling, um, but by increasing the length of the string or decreasing the length of the string by a ratio. Um, so one ratio suggested as the basis of Polyclitus' canon is the square root of two. Now that might sound abstruse and arcane, but in practice it's actually kind of easy to do and has a certain sense to it. Basically it works like this. You take your base unit, let's say it's whatever, the length of the last knuckle on your little finger uh, to your fingertip, that distance. We'll give that length the value of one. Now you make a square whose sides are also the length of one. Now draw a diagonal line from corner to corner through that square, and the length of that diagonal will measure about 1.414. Its actual specific precise length is unknown because it's an irrational number, but 1.414 or thereabouts is the square root of two. So how would you use this in building up a figure in clay? Well, if you look at your finger, you know, take a look at your last segment of your little finger, and you'll see that it's smaller or shorter than the middle segment of that same finger. And the middle segment is actually shorter than the base or first segment of that same finger. But how much smaller? How much bigger? The differences in length aren't nice, clean multiples. It's, it's not like your middle segment is twice as long as your last segment, right? It might be close to mm, one and a half, maybe. Now, obviously, everyone is going to be different, but using the ratio of 1 to 1.414 will give you a plausible proportion of one part to another. And you just keep going up from there. The ratio of finger length to palm length, and then palm to hand, hand to forearm, every part relating to every other part, building one on another just like how a stack of perfect fifths develop into a musical scale known as Pythagorean tuning. Now, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what the key to Polyclitus' canon is or was. Unless we wish to create the exact aesthetic of a particular 5th century Greek sculptor, and few of us do. A perfect proportional canon is an interesting aesthetic theory and may be useful in design concepts, but the subjectivity of human proportions from one to another, as well as the subjective nature of what different people find beautiful or ideal, it just makes the idea of a particular number or a particular proportion as a key to beauty nothing more than a mental exercise. <laughs>
Now, at the same time, if we can imagine being back in the 5th century, or at any time in the world of ancient Greece or Rome, the novelty and the utility and, and perhaps just the common sense of such an idea occurring as it did in the first chapters of the history of Western figurative art, the idea would have seemed irresistible and perhaps even inevitable. Now, the mathematical canon of Polycletus is just one experiment in aesthetics that Polycletus explored in his work. He wasn't just the pioneer of proportion, but also of balance and harmony. His pursuit of beauty was thorough enough that Pliny the Elder, in describing the work of Polycletus, wrote, He made what the artists have called the canon, and from which, as a sort of standard, they study the lineaments, so that he, of all men, is thought in one work of art to have exhausted all the resources of art. Now, words like harmony and balance have fairly concrete definitions when referring to elements of music, but how do these words apply to the sculpture of Polycletus? What were these resources Pliny said he exhausted? We'll examine these elements in some of Polycletus' sculpture when the sculptor's funeral continues. Hello, everyone. Thanks for putting up with my long absence. Uh, for those of you listening in the year 2020 or beyond, this means nothing to you, so don't pay attention. But for everyone else, you know I've been gone for something like eight months. Most of that time was expected as I traveled around the world teaching workshops and giving lectures and whatnot. But I'll tell you what, after I came home, I crashed hard. And I just squirreled myself away in my studio and just had some quality me time. And I needed it. I was just burnt out, and I needed to recharge. And here I am, recharged. So uh, thank you for your patience, and uh, please know that you won't have to wait another eight months for the next episode after this one. I'm, I'm going to be back on track. Now, I'm releasing this episode in early November 2019 at a time when a lot of you are settling back into the routine of an academic year in schools and ateliers around the world as students and as instructors. And I hope you make the most of it and that you learn tons. And that goes for the teachers, too. And everyone, you know, I, I would very much appreciate it if you could pass the word, you know, to all the new first-year students about the podcast. If you are still listening to The Sculptor's Funeral after 80 episodes, I imagine you find it somehow helpful and educational. So if you could make a point to spread the word, I'd thank you for that. And hopefully your students will thank you as well. So now I want to go over the works, the other works of Polycletus that come down to us in the form of later Roman copies. And I want to talk a little about certain elements in these sculptures that have influenced, well, basically all of figurative sculpture since their creation. So I've already mentioned the uh, young boxer, the Westmacott youth uh, that uh, Polycletus made, and also the athlete scraping himself with a strigil known as Apoximenos, uh, the one that is now lost. Well, there's a, there's a bunch of other work by Polycletus that is lost as well including uh, an enormous chryselephantine statue of the goddess Hera for the Temple of Hera in Argos. He additionally did a now-lost Hermes statue and a couple of Hercules statues, and one statue of two nude youths playing knuckle bones. Now, the game of knuckle bones was basically the ancient Greek version of playing with jacks. And according to Pliny the Elder, the knuckle bone statue had no equal in terms of quality. But like all the other statues I've mentioned, it doesn't survive. And there are more statues that are lost that I could name, but the names of these statues are all we have. Now, Pliny the Elder, in his book, The Natural History, mentions another statue by Polycletus which does survive, at least in fragments of copies of the original. And it's a statue of a wounded Amazon warrior. Now, as you probably know, Amazons were a tribe of mythological Greek female warriors, famed for having voluntarily removed one of their breasts to aid in their archery skills. Well, the Greek city of Ephesus was said to have been founded by the tribe of the Amazons, and a temple to the goddess Artemis, goddess of the hunt and the sort of Greek equivalent to the Roman goddess Diana, that temple was built in Ephesus. And no one is sure exactly how or why, but apparently the temple, this temple of uh, Artemis, was decorated with several full-scale, freestanding statues in the round 
representing wounded Amazons. And interestingly, they weren't all done at the same time. They weren't all done by the same sculptor either. And because of this, a tradition grew up around the creation of these statues that may or may not have anything to do with the truth. But this tradition or legend or history, whichever it is, was recorded by Pliny. Now, Pliny asserts that the statues were actually part of an ongoing competition between sculptors, which played out over time. He writes, The most celebrated of these artists, though born at different times, have joined in a trial of skill in the Amazons which they have respectively made. When these statues were dedicated in the Temple of Diana at Ephesus, it was agreed, in order to ascertain which was the best, that it should be left to the judgment of the artists themselves who were then present. Accordingly, the first rank was assigned to Polycletus, the second to Phidias, the third to Chrysalis, the fourth to Sidon, and the fifth to Fradman. Now, we know who the first and second place winners are, right? Polycletus and Phidias. Now, as for Chrysalis, he would later become famous for a portrait bust of Pericles, but of Sidon and Fradman, little is known. And actually, outside of Pliny's mentioning of him, Sidon isn't known at all. But at least three wounded Amazon types have been discovered and attributed to this particular grouping at Ephesus, and are now located in various museums around the world. Now, all the surviving copies of all these Amazons are in fragments, and many have been heavily restored. And sometimes the restorations were made by copying missing parts from other wounded Amazon statues. And sometimes other parts were just invented. So for me, these sort of mix-and-match, fill-in-the-blank restorations, they don't hold the same sort of interest that other competitions between artists usually hold for me. You know, like the competition between Brunelleschi and Ghiberti for the Florence baptistry doors. But if you'd like to see at least, you know, approximations of how Polyclitus and Phidias approached an identical theme, uh, then head on over to the Sculptor's Funeral dot com and check out the image gallery for this episode, which is episode 80. And you'll find images of the Amazon that has been attributed to Polyclitus and the Amazon that has been attributed to Phidias, although who really knows which is which, which is whose. Um, and you'll also, of course, find other images of Polyclitus's other work there as well. And seriously, if you can, go to the image gallery while listening to the next part of the podcast, because we're going to be directly comparing and contrasting and analyzing several works by Polyclitus in detail. And the points I'll be raising are just going to be more easily understood when you have pictures of the work right in front of you. So finally, let's get to the two most famous surviving works by Polyclitus, known through several existing marble copies, the Diadumenos and the Doriferous. Now the Diadumenos... It's a sculpture I'm sure you've seen. It's a, it's a male nude statue standing in contraposto, head turned to the side, and his arms both raised. It's kind of hard to tell what he's doing because in most of the surviving copies, he's missing a hand or two. But the statue represents an athlete tying a ribbon around his forehead. Now, the ribbon is called a diadem or a diadem, hence the name diadumenos, the ribbon tire. Now, the ribbon symbolizes uh, an athletic victory of some sort, just like ribbons do today, only we tend to wear them around our necks rather than tie them around our heads like a bandana. Now, the Doriferous, or Spear Bearer, is another very famous work by Polyclitus, perhaps his most famous of all. Now, the Spear Bearer stands in contraposto with one arm raised to a little bit above waist level with his hand in a position which suggests it wants held a spear, as the name Doriferous implies. And that's it. It's just a male nude, one arm raised, standing in contraposto. And it's perfect. At least, it's considered as perfect as Greek classical statuary ever got. There's something about the perfect balance of pose and proportion in every aspect of this statue that has captivated artists and art lovers since it was made in bronze around 440 B.C., and after it was rediscovered in marble copies in Herculaneum and Pompeii. It's so perfect that historians have speculated that it's not an athlete at all, but the hero, Achilles. And many art historians suggest, or even positively claim, that the spear bearer, the Doriferous, 
is, in fact, the sculpture Polyclitus made as an exemplar of his aesthetic theory, which he called the canon. Now, some writers, like Pliny, have the spear-bearer and the canon as separate works. But if Doriferous isn't actually the canon, it, along with the Diodomenos, are the closest works we have to the canon. And in all likelihood, these statues reflect Polyclitus' theories just as well as the original canon did. So, let's dig into it. Now, I've already covered the various theories around the proportional system of Polyclitus, but that's really only half the story here. The other half is the pose of these figures. And it's in the pose where we will find ideas of balance and harmony and rhythm and symmetry, which are all summed up in the Greek word symmetria. So if you can, bring up the images on the image gallery page for Diodomenos and Doriferous, or if you want, just do a, you know, a Google image search for Diodomenos and Doriferous, and then place those images side by side. Now, the first thing we can say about these two figures is that they, of course, stand in contraposto. Any first-year art student or art history student can tell you that. A contraposto, the pose in which the weight of the figure is placed on one leg, causing one hip to rise and the other to sink, counterbalanced by dropping the shoulder on the side of the high hip, giving a lateral S-curve to the spine, we're all familiar with this, right? as were the artists of the Renaissance. In fact, when sculptors of the early 15th century turned to the ancients for antique precedents, one of the very first elements adapted from the classics was the pose of contraposto, and it's been with us ever since. Now, Polyclitus did not invent contraposto. Contraposto was first spotted in 480 BC in the Critios Boy, and that's 40 years before the Doriferous. But Polyclitus made it his own, and it's from his example, and from the school of Polyclitus which arose in his wake, to which the Renaissance and the Neoclassicists and the academics all turned for inspiration. However, there is so much more to contraposto than just putting your weight on one leg. Although today it seems like all many people think about when thinking about contraposto is hips and shoulders and curvy spines. But take another look at the Doriferous and the Diodomenos, and notice that the non-weight-bearing leg in each of these statues is placed further back than the weight-bearing leg. This causes the heel to rise on the non-weight-bearing leg. Um, by the way, the, the non-weight-bearing leg is also known as the free leg. Now, there's a name for this position, with the, the free leg being behind uh, the... Uh, the weight-bearing leg. It's called ponderation. Now, ponderation in the Doriferous causes the statue to look like it is in the process of taking a step, while the style of ponderation in the Diodomenos, combined with his gesture of the rest of the body, causes the statue to look like it has come to a halt from a step in order to tie his ribbon. So ponderation, the use of ponderation, can imply past or present movement. I have just taken a step, or I am taking a step. And yet another way ponderation can be used is by placing the free leg forward of the weight-bearing leg. Now, we don't have an example of this in the work of Polyclitus, but it's a, it's a point that I really want to make, so I'm going to introduce another sculptor into the mix. His name is Naukaides. He was a disciple of Polyclitus, a sculptor who uh, taught for Polyclitus at his school in Argos. And in fact, Nalcides was the teacher of Polyclitus' own son. Polyclitus' son was known as Polyclitus the Younger. So, Nalcides worked very, very much in the style of his master, Polyclitus, to the point that sometimes work by Nalcides gets attributed to Polyclitus. And one such sculpture, made by Nalcides, is called the Discophorus, or discus bearer. Now, this isn't to be confused with Discobolus, the discus thrower, made by Myron. Those are two different statues. And you'll find the discus bearer, Discophorus, by Naukaides in the image gallery as well. So why don't you go ahead and bring up a photo of that one, and we'll use it as an example of the theories of Polyclitus, which it most certainly is. Anyway, so I was talking about ponderation, and how in ponderation you can either place the foot of the free leg towards the rear or towards the front, and thereby change the implications of the gesture. 
So in the discophorus, we see the foot is placed forward. Now, the ponderation here doesn't look like the figure is taking a step, but rather feels like a standing figure that perhaps took a step and then falls back to rests on his weight-bearing rear leg. Of course, it really does take the whole pose to communicate the idea, but the location of the free leg in ponderation, as opposed to simple standing contraposto, it does a lot to reinforce the idea of past, present, or future motion. And there are more ways to vary contraposto than just with ponderation. Now, take a look now at the discus bearer and the spear bearer, you know, the discophorus and the deriferous. Now, notice that we have one high hip, one low hip, one high shoulder, one low shoulder, one straight leg, one bent leg, and one straight arm and one bent arm. Every limb, which is one of a pair, is in a different position than its partner. So if you've got one arm straight, the other arm's bent. If you've got one leg straight, then the other leg is bent. And that's literally the definition of uh, contraposto. Contraposto means counterpoint. If one thing is one th way, then the other thing is going to be the other way. But notice something else. If, for instance, on these statues, the left knee is bent, then the left elbow is bent. And if the right knee is bent, then the right elbow is bent. With both arms raised, the, the diadomenus, the ribbon tire, uh, is an exception. But the other two statues follow a pattern that is repeated again and again in classical Greece and in the Renaissance and all the way through to the present day. There are exceptions everywhere, of course, but much more often than not, work which tries to emulate the, the classics, the Greeks, uh, it follows this pattern. You basically end up with a straight side of the body and a bent side of the body. And this also has a name. It's called chiasmus. Now, chiasmus is Greek uh, for crossing or crisscrossing, and it implies a reversal of order. So if one thing is one way, then the next thing like it will be reversed in some way. Now, chiasmus is also a term used to describe music and literature, and I'll give you some examples. Um, have you ever thought about the rather catchy phrase uttered by President John F. Kennedy, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country? Well, it's a memorable line because it's poetic in some way, but it doesn't rhyme. The way in which it's poetic is called chiasmus. The important words in the first half of the phrase, country and you, are reversed in the second half. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And it's the same thing in the phrase, I'd rather have a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. Now, in this phrase, instead of whole words being uh, repeated and reversed, it's just sounds that are being repeated and reversed, front and bot, right? Bottle in front of me, frontal lobotomy. And it's a phrase which is a weird non sequitur thing to say, but, you know, I'd rather have a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. It doesn't really actually make sense, but it's the chiasmus which makes it feel witty and clever. I mean, think about it. If you, if you just said, I'd rather be drinking than have a brain operation, <laughs> it, it doesn't have the same punch, does it? Chiasmus makes it graceful. And you've heard a million phrases like this, all for one and one for all. It's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. These are all examples of chiasmus. And yes, for you poetry nerds out there, I do also know that it's a particular form of chiasmus called metaboly. But in sculpture, which is what we're really talking about, it's always called chiasmus. And once you know about chiasmus in sculpture, you see it everywhere. Rare is the exception of a classically inspired statue in contraposto with both arms hanging to the side or performing parallel or duplicate action. Nine times out of ten, you'll find the bent arm on the same side of the body as the bent knee. The Apollo Belvedere, Donatello's St. Mark, Michelangelo's David, Donatello's David, Verrocchio's David, Cellini's Perseus. The effect of having the bent arm and leg on one side of the body and the straight arm and leg on the other side is that you end up with a stable side of the body and an active side of the body. Now the side with the weight-bearing leg and the straight arm, visually it feels like an anchor or a base point for the figure which is balanced by the active, moving, bent limbs on the other side. And I want to emphasize here 
just how intentional and how designed the chiasmus pose actually is. It's not something that many people fall into naturally. In fact, if you're able to right now, go ahead and stand up. All right, just everyone stand up and put yourself in contraposto. Really just, you know, throw your weight on one leg. Now, I want you to place one hand on your hip. Don't think about it, just do it. Now, I'm willing to bet that most of you put your hand on your weight-bearing hip, the hip above your weight-bearing leg. Now, that is a natural position to take, and it's a very common pose found in art schools everywhere. It's a standard academic pose, but it is not a standard classical pose. For instance, take a look at a picture of Donatello's David or Verrocchio's David. Both statues uh, are figures with their hands on their hip, but they are resting their hands on the non-weight-bearing hip, on the hip of the free leg. Now, try standing like that, and you'll feel how posed and unnatural it is. Physically, it just doesn't make much sense. I mean, if you're going to rest your hand on your hip and thereby support the weight of your arm and the shoulder on that hip, you would want to rest it on something stable, like a weight-bearing hip, not on a hip that isn't itself supported from underneath. It doesn't make sense physically or architecturally, but visually, it does. You've got a stable side, and you've got an active side. And so this chiastic pose is certainly one that was consciously thought out to provide certain visual effects. And that certain visual effect? Well, that is symmetria, the unification of balance and proportion, of action and of rest. First theorized in sculpture by Polycletus and sought after by his generations of followers. The work of Polycletus and his followers demonstrates remarkable balance in pose and proportion and action. From the proportions of the body, to the chiasmus of the limbs, to the action of the pose, even right down to the turn of the head, every aspect is counterbalanced so that the figure appears to be both stable and active at the same time. Let me explain exactly what I mean. Take, for example, the Doriferous, the spear-bearer. What do we see? We see a stable side of the body and an active side. But he appears to step forward, which is active. So one would think this work depicts a man more in action than at rest. But with the slight turn of the head towards the stable, fixed side of the body, it gives the statue a slight sense of introspection, of a turning inward that counterbalances the active ponderation. Subtle as it is, whether the turn of the head is turned towards the active side or the stable side can change the feeling of a piece to an introspective work or to an energetic work. Take, for example, Michelangelo's David. David's head is turned sharply to the active side of his body, making the David a decidedly energetic piece, rather than one that seeks balance the way the Doriferous does. The Apollo Belvedere uses the turn of the head towards the active side in exactly the same way Michelangelo's David does. And active figures are great, but that's not what Polycletus was going for. He wanted to walk the tightrope of perfect balance. And we can look to the Discophorus by Naukaides, his pupil, and we can find the same sense of balance achieved in different ways. So the free leg is in forward ponderation, as we've seen, but its position implies a figure who has shifted back to rest on the stable leg rather than forward motion. And here we see the head turned towards the active side, but with the head bent slightly downward, striking a balance between action and introspection, and in a very different way than we find in the Doriferous. Polycletus thought about the visual and psychological impact of every aspect of his figures, more profoundly than anyone of his time, and probably more than just about anyone today. He knew the power of the turn of a head, or the shift of weight, or the subtle interplay of one length, or width, or volume to another, and the meaning these minute variations can convey, and just how difficult it is to get everything just right, and how one error of judgment, a little too much clay here, or not enough clay there, meant the difference between beauty and mediocrity. And this special knowledge brought Polycletus lasting fame. Plutarch, writing essays on virtue centuries after the death of Polycletus, in describing the difficult task of living a life of intention and purpose, 
used the example of Polycletus and wrote, Those who are making progress do not indiscriminately accept any action, but using reason to guide them, they bring each one into place and fit it where it belongs. And we may well conceive that Polycletus had this in mind when he said that the task is hardest for those whose clay has come to within a fingernail. Well, I want to thank you all once again for listening. Don't forget, you can check out additional content at the Sculptor's Funeral website, thesculptorsfuneral.com, or on our YouTube channel and our Facebook group page. In fact, I actually have a, a new-ish video that I posted to YouTube uh, of a lecture that I gave in New York in June, and uh, it has a rather provocative title. It's called Why Sculpture is Boring. It's a bit different from the content of the podcast. I, you know, I, I put some opinions out there that have been sort of rattling around in my head for a while. And some people agree with what I had to say and some didn't, which is fine. It's opinion, right? It's just, it's just something that I had been wanting to do for a while. But I didn't want to turn a podcast episode into some sort of bully pulpit. That's not really what the podcast is about. Uh, you can also subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or, you know, the dozens of other podcasts out there. And you can receive the podcast automatically, download it onto your PC, tablet, or mobile device as soon as new episodes air. And if you want to help the podcast reach other people, leave a review or give the podcast a rating wherever you subscribe. And tell your students and tell your teachers. Also, as always, at the sculptorsfuneral.com website, you can stream the complete archives of the show. You can check out the image galleries for this and for other episodes. And you can support the podcast by buying some Sculptor's Funeral merchandise or by making a donation. And finally, click on the link of the sponsor of the podcast, Blick Art Supplies, at thesculptorsfuneral.com. Clicking on that link and buying from Blick helps to support the podcast. And for that, however you may choose to support the podcast, I thank you. Thanks again for listening and have a productive week.